Yeah. <laughs> Welcome everybody to another podcast with the Fall Line with Chaos and Company. I'm Dave Capron. I'm a PSIA AASI Ed staff member here in the Eastern Division. I'm in the Alpine world and Telemark world here, and I'm also joined by Angela Ross. Morning, Dave. Yeah. Morning. We're also here this morning with Pete Allison. Pete is a PhD and an associate professor of recreation, park, and tourism management at Penn State College. Um, and he's here with us today to chat a little bit about his research, but also the work he's been doing with PSIA and also some other organizations like Bazi, Bazi, sorry, uh, the British Association of Snowboard Instructors, which I think you're a member there also, aren't you, Pete? That's right, I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great to have you today. We, we, I think you have your coffee with you there, right? I am caffeinated. Yeah, yeah, here in the fall line with Chaos and Company, you have to have a, a coffee or if you're watching in the evening, maybe you grab a bourbon or a beer or if you maybe do some decaf in the in the evening. I'm not sure you want to do the full full test in the evening, but um, thanks for being with us today. Do the Irish coffee in the evening? Yeah, there you go. Put the Irish coffee in there. So, so Pete, I understand that um, you've, you've taught quite a bit with, with Basie also. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I've been... Um... I've been teaching skiing for probably 20 years now, and um, I was a late starter to skiing. I didn't I didn't first put on any skis until I was 19, yeah. and um, and then about the last 20 years I've been teaching. Uh, before I moved to the states, I was uh, teaching at the University of Edinburgh, and uh, we used to take our, our students there. Uh, I was teaching mostly um, outdoor education students or physical education students, a kind of combination, and um, so. We had a long-standing ski program there because we knew that if those people became passionate about snow sports, they were people who were going out into schools to teach in schools. And if you got teachers enthusiastic about snow sports, they would then take the pupils out and run ski trips. And so we ran these ski courses that were really about trying to share the passion. Um, they weren't about making people amazing skiers, they were about making them good enough skiers so they would lead a ski trip, take responsibility, and then that they would take those students to ski schools where they would get their professional ski instruction. Uh, and um, we, know that, we know that that program was very effective because it had run for about 40 years. And um, in that time, you know, of course, you end up with these people who are pupils who are then running um, departments in schools and taking these ski trips. And we've got pupils going to do internships at those schools. And um, so it was a really nice kind of cycle. And um, so so that was uh, a big part of my teaching um, in the UK. And I worked some seasons uh, in the UK uh, mostly, and then also um, worked with Bayesley, which I can say more about um, if you want yeah. to talk about that as, as we go in terms of working with their quality assurance and their curriculum and that kind of thing. Because uh, you have some other outdoor interests. I know they're kind of personal, it's just uh, canoeing and mountaineering, and, and and I guess you're pretty addicted to CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> have you been talking to Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should. We'll have to have Dave. Well, we'll, Angela and I will have to ask Dave to come on. We can talk about that. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to say it's a closely guarded secret, but it clearly is not a closely guarded <laughs> secret. But, um, it's, it's like that, that joke about uh, how do you know if there's a ski instructor in the room? Yeah. Don't worry, they'll tell you. <laughs> so, same about CrossFit. How yeah. do you know if somebody's into CrossFit? They'll tell you. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, my, I mean, my um, original kind of passion for the outdoors, I guess, was... Um, when I was about 16, I, um, I got a place to go on an expedition to Greenland, Greenland and uh, spend uh, six weeks in northeast Greenland uh, in the wilderness up there in an area called the Stowling, Stowling's Alps. And it was with uh, an organization called the British Schools Exploring Society, who were based at the Royal Geographical Society in London. And um, it was just a, this mind boggling experience for me. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd been to France. I don't think I'd ever been abroad beyond going to France. And then suddenly I found myself six weeks in Greenland and that's where that's actually where I, I, I did put on some uh, tele skis there and um, skied down one of the glaciers in the middle of nowhere which with hindsight was probably a really stupid idea is I mean, you know <laughs> learning to tele ski amongst crevasses in the wilderness where it's probably <laughs> going to take 48 hours to be rescued 
may not be the most uh, most intelligent <laughs> kind of decision, but that's what we yeah. did in those days. And um, and I, I guess that kind of really gave me a passion for mountains um, and glaciers in particular, or glaciers, um, as you would say. And yeah. um, I just I just love that being in that kind of environment and of um, that kind of got me into mountaineering and that got me into skiing and you know and, and all that kind of goes with it. And I've spent lots of time since then in Greenland leading expeditions and taking young people there and kind of um i suppose in some ways that would be my one of my big trigger events for a passion about learning experientially and um values and experiential learning which i know you're kind of keen to keen to talk more about so yeah, yeah. i think that's a that, that experience yeah, was really pivotal for me yeah uh, and and good thing you didn't go into a crevasse or might have changed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a different experience. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting because um, you know, with with skiing and a lot of stuff we're doing is so much on experiential learning and and trying to create the learning environment and um, looking at our students individually is you know a big thing here in the U.S. with PSA and Aussie, and and it seems to really relate a, a well to your research um that you do in terms of and i'm very interested in in how your two interests of your research values and experiential learning how those connect sure um well i what i can tell you is i don't have one clear straight answer for you um <laughs> but uh, i mean my own my own uh, my, my background is in um my academic background is in moral philosophy um and philosophy of education in particular and so um one of the things that i know um my friends and family found find frustrating is that i'm more interested in the questions than i am in the answers um <laughs> and so you know the kind of idea of how do we develop our values um particularly young people emerging adults you know how do our um how, how are those transitional years important in developing our values and what kind of experiences help to contribute to that um, is what I get really excited about. Um, and then thinking about, okay, what does that mean for educators and what is high quality? I mean, in some respects, what does high quality education look like, but more specifically, how, what does high quality outdoor education look like? And, um, you know, I think that's changed over the years and the idea that we might focus on experiences and creating quality experiences that people can then um, go through a process of meaning making from and that that would inform their values is that that's kind of the crux of what I get interest what I'm interested in and then the idea that we don't necessarily impose values onto people you know which a lot of education is about imposing values, but creating experiences where people can uh, distill their own values from that and explore their values um, is kind of how I see a lot of outdoor experiences. Um, and, and that, again, relates directly back to my own experiences with taking part in expeditions and then leading expeditions, whether that's, you know, with a small group of friends or whether it's, um, you know, bigger, bigger groups of young people is um, trying to create those kind of scenarios and have time where people can explore that, that meaning making process because um, it often takes time to happen. It doesn't happen overnight necessarily. Angel, they're very quiet. I think he's writing. I'm reflecting on where yeah. I learned my values. On the skateboard park? A lot of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, and I, and I, you know, I, I taught for a long time in public ed setting 20 years, and it's interesting to hear what Pete has to say about, uh, and when Pete and I have had conversations in the past, so we, it's, you know, um, the, the reality the like the realness of learning on expedition versus the, uh, contrived nature of a classroom setting, you know, and, um, but I, but you look back on what's powerful and you, you know, you learn, you learn lessons on the ski hill, you know, you, you, you learn lessons falling in the crevasse. And we certainly learned lessons on, uh, on skateboards in the eighties. And, and, and I almost said in the skate parks, but we didn't have them, you know? So in the eighties, it was, uh, um, there, there, and like with skateboarding, there wasn't an element of, 
um, competition that was like necessarily inherent in what we did in southwestern Pennsylvania, you know, and I and I've you read articles, you, you see documentaries now about these guys who were pros when we were kids and they were expected to compete. And there was a heavy, uh, heavy responsibility on a on a small handful of them to win. But it was all influenced by sales. But but the vast majority of skateboarders in the in the 80s coming up didn't compete. If you did compete, it was more about like who can be the most comical for your you know, the two minutes you get on the on the little uh, DIY street course, like who can make the, the, the crowd laugh or cheer the loudest rather than who who's doing the hardest trick, you know. Um, so competition didn't drive much. Art drove more. Music drove just as much as art. Fun drove more than the two of those put together. Um, and so now, I, you know, that's a long way of saying. I look now, I'm, you know, say 35 years later, um, I don't follow competition. I don't follow sporting competition. I don't watch the Steelers. That's blasphemy in southwestern Pennsylvania. Those kids were shoving us in lockers when I was in high school. Like, I could have cared less about about what was going on with professional football. And that, not soccer, Pete, like real football, American football. <laughs> <laughs> Although rug, rug, rugby's a nice. I'll give you rugby. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, like, I, I did learn values then, experientially. Cause, and I think the best, the hallmark of experiential learning is you don't even know you're learning it. It's just life. It's like almost, uh, it's hunter-gatherer in a way. It, it, it's it's um, primitive education is the most real. So, you know, now I, I really have a hard time being interested in, I know this is going to sound terrible, I have a really hard time being interested in the U.S. ski team. I, I don't follow the races. I don't know where the World Cup races are. I don't know who's got the most points. I, I know that the, I know that ski racing drives ski technology and I know what I want my skis to do when they're under my feet. So I care about it from that aspect, like the engineering piece of it, but only because I want to be able to express myself on the hill the way I want to do it. So the technology is important to me. The standings aren't, you know, and I, and I find myself in a minority because of that, that system, that belief system or that, you know, my, my worldview I can't participate in sports com conversations and, and I don't relate to that. But, you know, one of the things that I can relate to may be, may be better than some people who came up in a more traditional competition or race oriented ski background, for example, is like, I really embrace the terrain park kids, you know, and, and I know there are, um, there are, and I'll say it, there are curmudgeonly instructors who see the terrain park as a nuisance. And I understand. I mean, I, I some of my some of the little the hills I liked at my home area have been um, dedicated to the terrain park now. But when you look and that's selfish, but you look at the overall value of what it's brought to the ski world and the snowboard world. Um, I, I really I think it's terrific. And I, and I you know, I'll make a plug for myself. We need people like me to appreciate that. <laughs> You know? <laughs> was that even an answer to your question? What did your What was your question? <laughs> I just I I kind of knew. I just looked and I could see you're writing something, and I I knew you were thinking about something. And and it is interesting when you look at the the park versus you know, or I mean, even when they're having the competition, like the X Games and all that stuff. I mean, there, it is a different environment in a lot of ways when I watch it than I watch ski racing. I mean, you see them just getting excited about each other's runs and, and um, you watch the kids out in the park, just, just cycling, you know, sessioning on one thing and trying to video in each other and cheering each other. And it's not really a, who got what done better than somebody else. It's like who got their own trip completed and, and watching them learn and work with each other. is really cool. I mean, that must, you know, with, with your stuff that you're doing with all your expeditions in the different places, that must be a lot of it, I would think. Yeah, and I, and I love that because it's you know to me to me it's this creativity that you see coming out in the park that um, I, I admire because I don't have that kind of creativity, <laughs> you know. And so people see that, and you know they see things and they, you know, they see tricks, they see op they see opportunities. You know, in the meantime, 
I'm doing short radius turns down the side of the piece because I'm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of wild, Me too. <laughs> and yeah. I, just, I just love that, um, you know, that expression of um, of personality and an opportunity. And um, so last year I um, I got to ski a few runs with AJ Oliver up in uh, Big Sky, who's for listeners who. Uh, don't know, don't know him. He's in the um, Warren Miller film this year, I think, or last year, or whichever. The most recent Warren Miller film. I mean, he, we we were just skiing down what looked to me like just normal piece. Talk about somebody with creativity. He like every turn, every turn was different. Everything was you know, it was like all this fun. Yeah. And I was just going, well, how does he do that? You know, it was just, it was, <laughs> you know, of course I could keep up. You know, I was kind of going, wait for me, but. Um, <laughs> You know what? What a ski! It's great to watch and, and see. I love that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think so. Just uh, one other thing that you you were just saying there, uh, Angelo, that re reminded me, and I know this is something you want to talk about, Dave. Was um, you know that Dewey, Dewey, John Dewey had this saying that um, school and education is is not preparation for life; it is life. And, and I love that kind of idea that, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's something that really spoke to me, at, you know, in, in school, because I was a high school dropout, um, was that I felt like my school experience was preparing me for life, but it wasn't living. And so it was like waiting for this thing called life to start when I was 18 or 20 or something like that rather than being something that was ongoing and i think that's you know i think that's part of what you're saying angelo about what experiential learning is that it's engaging you don't even know it's happening you're just engaged and learning and you're you're kind of intrigued by something that you want to explore engage with um and, and figure it out you know and it's that problem solving kind of component which of course you know appeals more and more to certain kinds of people than others and you know that kind of thing but that idea of solving a problem, I think, is is really crucial to experiential learning. Whether that's developing mastery of a skill, or whether it's you know a, a more literal problem problem based learning approach. That that's interesting, Pete. Um, if, do I want to do I understand right? You you felt like when you were in in secondary school, like that was fake. And you had to you had to wait till this point in time until real life started. That was how you that was your view of it. Exactly. Yeah, I th I think my group of friends we were our view was a little different. We felt like school was a necessary, um, like we knew we had to earn this credential, right? And that your dad like beat the hell out of you if you got in trouble there. So, like we knew there were expectations there that we had to do but i don't think we viewed ours as a like we had to reach a point in time until things got real i think we felt like we had the real part of our life which was skateboarding and not school and then the school part but they were concurrent yeah yeah right? does that make sense that makes a lot of sense to me i, I can see that and our experiential piece, like it's interesting, you went to Greenland, that was your experiential piece when you probably before you dropped out, right? You were 16, you said. So ours was like, our experiential piece was from 3 p.m. till we had to go to bed, you know, but it was, but it was ongoing throughout those years. So like, we didn't get to go to Greenland, but one of, one of the things we did do, you know, we'd get our skateboards after school and I was in a little tiny blue collar town. There was no skate park. You had to like find spots and session them until you got kicked out or wait until work ended and you could go skate this bank or whatever. But we spent years and years and years and hours and hours and hours like sessioning a two inch high curb in front of somebody's house. And on the surface, like you, you look at kids doing that. I know what the our neighbors are like. Look at these idiots! Like, why would you crash into a curb for four hours? You know, but but when you when you have our environment was so simple. Like the two inch curb was such a simple environment that where the expedition happened was in your brain. It was an internal expedition because it's like, how creative can I get on this? 
you know. And so we were never bored doing it. But it was just a different, the, it's just a different setting for the expedition. Greenland is magnificent. The two-inch curb is not. But maybe somewhere they both meet in the middle because if it, depending on your analysis of it, how you reflect on it, it all works out to be your experience. Your, your, it's your expedition. So, so that makes me, I mean, I'm totally with you. And I think it makes me think about, you know, of course, teaching snow sports. And, you know, I, I learned to ski in Scotland, which, um, I mean, at that time, you did get some snow in Scotland, but it was unreliable. And, um, you know, nine days out of 10, it was, um, it was raining horizontally and, you know, blowing, blowing a strong gale and, um, you, you had foggy. to learn to ski in the foggy, <laughs> or, you know. So and Pennsylvania you know, must be like a homecoming for you. Exactly. <laughs> well, welcome well, home, dude. Pennsylvania is tropical in comparison. Uh, uh, but, you know, you, you, learn to, you learn to ski there and then, you know, you learn to teach skiing there. And the people who are, who are really good ski instructors are, are learning, are, are teaching people on, you know, a, a piece of, a patch of snow that is 10 foot square. And they're teaching people for three hours on that. And you, I mean, you've got to be creative to do that. And then, you know, people, people who train in those kind of environments, and then they find themselves teaching in the Alps. They're like, oh, this is easy. Look at all this snow. I could, no problem here at all, kind of thing. And, and I think there's something to be said for that, the hard craft of learning in, of, of learning to teach in that kind of environment, because you, you can't just rely on the scenery. You can't, you know, it's like, you know, occupying yourself for hours on end on, you know, on that lip um, outside somebody's house. It's the same kind of thing. You've got to be creative. You've got to be imaginative for what you're trying to do. And, and um, you know, I think that to me, that's a lot about the craft and putting the work in, you know, that I don't think there are shortcuts. Becoming good at teaching skiing or snowboarding or any, any sport takes a lot of work. And when you see somebody good, it's wow. You know, when I watch somebody who's really good at teaching snow sports, I think that is amazing um, for whatever it is they're doing. I'm, I'm really, I'm fascinated about, about the idea of credentials and how we hold credentials in such regard now. Um, and, and I, you know, there's no doubt that, that a, that a lot of it is, is, um, influenced by money the university system is big big business but you know you look back in time you know 100 years or whatever transcendentalists had many of them had very few academic credentials but we hold them in regard their poetry their writing and whatnot and and we accept them as authorities and we accept them as gifted and experts and everything else but it's almost like these days We've, we've gotten away from that acceptance of somebody's uh, judgment and unless they have a certain credential. And that, that when I taught school, that was one of the things that always really bothered me that um, I think the underlying be the belief that was, so you talked about school instills values, you know, until you have your bachelor's degree, you can't, you don't have an opinion until you have your master's degree, until you have your doctorate, you don't have, your opinion doesn't count. But the reality of it is that if you're a thoughtful person and you're really interested, you don't need the master's degree if you've spent the same amount of energy and time learning about the thing you're talking about, you know? Right. And we, we whatever, whatever we call them, amateurs, like, am, you know, amateur paleontologists have made some of the biggest discoveries, but does that discovery not count because you don't have a master's degree from the right school, you know? But the, I, it's just some. It's just sort of a. Uh, I guess it's an academic exercise I do in my head. When does somebody get to have an opinion about something? When do we accept that opinion as valid? And 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 is it an expert opinion? If you know well, this guy's got a you know he's got level three, but this guy doesn't have any certification, but he's been really thoughtfully studying snow sports instruction for 35 years. There's got to be something there, you know. What it. I'm sure you've met some people, Pete, on expedition that didn't have the formal credentials, but who were actually the 
the trendsetters and the leaders in that world. Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, I think that in some ways that idea of opening up access to education um, in a broad and a broad conceptualization of education is um, is something that I hold of to be of great value because of you know being a being a high school dropout myself because I didn't see I didn't see any point in what I was learning in school it didn't make a lot of sense for me and so you know and, and I think the you know the the work that I started started and did for about ten years or so with Bayesy was all about that, you know, because I was working with, and, and some of the people would describe themselves as this, so I'm not, I, I don't mean this, what I'm about to say, my, you know, people might say, oh, that sounds a bit offensive, but, you know, they would describe themselves as ski bums, and they would say, oh, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm no smart man, you know, I'm no smart guy, I'm no smart woman, I, I'm just a ski bum, you know, I, I'm, I'm not intelligent like you folks kind of thing, and, and then they'd proceed to say something that was just, absolutely at the crux of the issue or right at the jugular you know and, and, and it was just like well I've been wondering about this and you think whoa hang on um you know that is a really um insightful comment and um so that kind of to me that idea of how do we recognize that learning or how do we um how do we give credit to that or how do we um yeah, how, how do you recognise that learning is a is a crucial question, so that people can um, communicate that. So, like a lot of the work that I did um, did in the UK was about that recognition of learning and putting that learning onto a scale called in Scotland it's called the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework, in order that people could communicate that learning to people outside of snow sports. So they could say, yeah, I, I know that when you look at my resume, it might look like I have been a ski bum for 15 years and now I'm looking for a, a real job, you know, and I can say that because my family continue and friends continue to ask me when I'm going to get a real job. Um, it's kind of the, the standard question, right? And I'm sure that there are listeners who can relate to that. And I can see that you can both relate to that as well. But, yeah. you know, and so, you know, we, we looked at that and we said, well, there are, there are a host of skills that are developed in working in the snow sports industry that we can communicate and they can be recognized as transferable skills. So, you have to have a certain level of knowledge and understanding in order to teach snow sports. You have to be able to apply that. You have to be able to communicate those ideas. If you work within, within the industry, you probably have some information, communication and technology skills as well, because you're dealing with bookings, you're dealing with communicating. You actually have a set of skills that are about relating to people across often many different levels of society and types of types of people within society. So, you know, if I think about, <clears throat> um, you know, in, in Europe, that's often class related because in Europe we're obsessed with class. So you can, you can relate to people from the upper classes right through to the working classes and everywhere in between in a kind of fluid, comfortable, respectful manner. You know, those are all skills that are transferable outside of snow sports into other contexts. And so um, that's a big part of what I've been working on is trying to get that communication done. You know, one of the best, um, one of the best, best, I'll call him a snow sports educator that I've ever met. Uh, I'm lucky enough to call him a friend too, um, is, is from Edinburgh. And he um, didn't graduate from high school. He became a joiner. He uh, became a ski instructor. He spent hours and hours and hours skiing on a dry slope in Edinburgh called Hill End. So the plastic kind of dendric stuff, which is for anybody who's ever skied on that, it's horrible. It's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> um, and he is, he has an incredible kind of mastery of both joinery and also of snow sports and so his, i mean his movement analysis is is just absolutely spot on he's an incredible skier 
and the mastery that he has, him, him and I talk about it often, goes back and forth between the two. So he says, you know what, if you're teaching snow sports, you've got to be able to get on with people. Well, guess what? When you go to price up a job as a joiner, the first thing people are really looking at you and saying is, is this someone who I trust to be in my home and are they going to do a good job? Well, they're not a long way off the kind of questions that people are asking about a snow sports educator, right? Do I trust this person either with me or with my family <laughs> to take them out into the mountains, into this environment? Are they going to do a good job of this? So the, those kind of transferable skills, I think, are, um, I think are really fascinating. And um, I'll, I'll stop in just a second. There's a, there's a really strong connection. If anybody is interested in this, Google World Economic Forum 21st Century Skills. And there are some that, that um, the, the information from there is evolving, um, evolving all the time, but the skills and connections there. And if you look down the list of what the World Economic Forum list has been those 21st century skills, when you think about a sports educator, it's hard not to put a tick against everything and say, yeah, these are all really strongly connected. So it's kind of placed in a language, I suppose, and, and um, trying to express that learning that um, I, I think there's great value in. Yeah, you said some cool things there and you started going to the international thing and, and I, I imagine it's a huge, huge drawback for you with COVID in terms of like, I know you've been working hard with connecting cultures in Oman and that's been going for a lot of years and with the young people you were talking about and, and developing these skills, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, that's a pretty interesting thing you've been doing and it's kind of, I would imagine it's a little bit on halt right now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that has been on halt for, um, through, through the COVID experience, unfortunately. Um, but that's, that's a great project that I've been working with for, um, almost, almost 10 years now. Um, it's based in Oman in the Middle East, which is, um, a very peaceful country. Um, it's, um, we often describe it as being the equivalent of the Switzerland of Europe. Um, so it is, they don't take strong political views other than the best thing to do is to get around the table and to talk about things and to try and work out the best um, way to progress um, in, in a peaceful and respectful manner. And um, so Oman's, Oman's where this is based and it was, um, it's a program that was actually started by a friend of mine, Mark Evans, who runs the Outward Bound School in Oman. And um, the, the idea behind it is that is to work with future leaders. And uh, so the project was sponsored by UNESCO and also um, the late Sultan Kabush. And um, the, what we do is we get together 18 young leaders from different countries. Traditionally, it's been across Europe and the Middle East. Um, a couple of years ago, we started to include students from um, the US as well. And they, um, they go and they spend a week in the desert um, with me and a team of other people. Um, my co-leader, Sakena, who is um, a Moroccan lady who um, lives in Muscat. And um, we take them into the desert for five days and we talk about culture and we talk about values and we talk about um, what makes them who they are and what makes each other who they are, where religion fits into that, where spirituality fits into that, why there are problems in society today, where extremism comes from, um, and what they can do about it. And so the, the kind of the tail end of the course is all about the kind of influence that they can have in their own societies and how they can make a difference. And for some that might be small differences and for others, others it's enormous differences. And so over the years, you know, there have been um, people who've done that course who've then gone on to be TV broadcasters in Jordan, for example, um, a position that holds considerable power and they've kind of referred to those experiences. And then um, people from Yemen who've returned to Yemen and anybody's familiar with the, um, the um, you know, the crisis in Yemen and it is a, um, a serious crisis that's been going on for a number of years now, they've been trying to influence positively from within the country as well. So it's, it's a great project um, that, you know, has been a huge honor to be involved with. And I've learned, you know, every time I go, 
I'm convinced that I learn more than anybody else because you hear all these stories and think, wow, this is, you know, the, the differences and the kind of circumstances in which people persevere are amazing. Um, and also the humor, you know, the way in which people find humor in, in that as well. And the kind of the teasing around stereotypes and where stereotypes come from is, um, is, is great fun. So, yeah. In a lot of your research, you you talked also about um, coming back from those expeditions back into into I don't know, you didn't use the term but I'm thinking real life or back into society I think was what you said. Um, so when you do these like for those young people, do they do they open up more in that situation than you think they would in more of you know where you didn't go into the desert or go on that like expedition type thing? Do they open up more there than they would? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I suppose this. I mean, my experience is that when you work with people like that and you've got a stretch of time with them, is that it's easy to open up. It's possible not to, because yeah. you're in this kind of more intensive kind of relationship. And um, and so one of the things that I became interested in was people open up and they kind of create these bonds and these, you know, lifelong friends. And they are, in, in many cases, lifelong friendships that people create. And then... Um, and, and they have these connections and then come home and find themselves struggling to fit in. Um, and the, the only way that I could make sense of that in any meaningful way was to think about it in terms of values. So what, what happens when we go into the wilderness, when we have those kind of experiences is we explore our values. We figure out who we are. And often if that's, you know, 17, 18, 19 year olds, meeting people from outside of their community for the first time it's the first time that they have presented themselves and thought and realized that other people hold different values other people have different experiences to the kind of experiences that they have they go to different kinds of schools they do different things in the schools they have, they just have a, a very different lives and that realization of course helps us to think about ourselves so um, then when people get home and they return back to that community there is this inevitable reflection that goes on to say well how does this what is this like you know i return and um i find myself um not being able to relate to the friends that i previously could relate to because i've had this out, out of world experience or out of body experience almost you know that um they their friends can't really relate, relate to and their friends are more interested in what's happened in the latest soap opera on TV or whatever it is. And these people are thinking about, okay, how can I get back into the mountains? How can I spend more time yeah. doing that kind of thing? Yeah. And I think, there's, I think there's some strong connections there with, um, with snow sports too. You know, um, if I think about some of the conversations that I've had with people on chairlifts, um, you know, between ski runs and people contemplating you know, it's, it's not quite the same, but it's not dissimilar. And then it's almost like stepping outside of your life and looking back in on it. You know, you take a, you take a holiday or a vacation and inevitably some of that, there's almost inevitably some reflection on, okay, where, where am I? What's going on? What's happening in life? And, um, sometimes they are moments of celebration and sometimes they're moments of questioning, am I doing the right thing? Do I want to be where I am doing what I'm doing, that kind of thing. And so I see a lot of those conversations and opportunities to me that they're all about values. They're about exploring values. And I think that um, being able to engage with people in those conversations is part of the job of teaching outdoors. Um, it kind of comes with it, whether you want it or not, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Hey, I, I think Angelo and Pete, why don't we take a short little break and we're going to come back Pete and talk a little bit more with Pete Allison. And we're probably going to go into a little bit about his work with uh, what he's been doing with PSA and maybe how some of us can get a little better at exploring experiential learning on the hill. Great. <laughs> 